Okay, great. I'd like to welcome everyone to Practical Microprofile with uh, Java EE, or you can tell that I submitted this six months ago, it should be Jakarta EE now. Um, I'm Ryan Kubrick. I work for Dassault Systems on Chemical Formulation Software. And so this presentation is about joining both of these technologies together, even though they're usually joined together. So just out of curiosity, how many of you already use a microprofile? Jakarta EE. Okay. Sounds good. Um, so I'll take you through the features. So the first is uh, just an update um, from last week. Uh, Jakarta EE is now, sorry, Java EE is now Jakarta EE. Um, that was announced well over a year ago. Um, it is now fully open sourced. Uh, Jakarta EE 8 was released on September 10th, uh, which was last week. They had a large one day conference. And so, and it's a feature equivalent for Java EE 8. So it's the exact same thing. It's just been re released uh, from the Eclipse Foundation. Um, so throughout the presentation from now on, I'll be referring, instead of Java EE, I'll be referring to it as Jakarta EE. Um, and it's, it's uh, Jakarta EE and not J2EE, which was the even older name that a lot of people still use, including job requisitions. Um, so to start off with, what is MicroProfile? Um, MicroProfile, like Jakarta EE, um, is an Eclipse Foundation project. Um, it is an open source set of specifications, like, Jakarta, like the stuff under Jakarta EE. Um, it started as a push to innovate Java starting back in uh, 2016 when there was kind of a lull in development due to changes at Oracle. So Java EE development had slowed down quite a bit. Um, so uh, the microprofile was the response to that to, to push uh, Java EE and the, the Java enterprise ecosystem forward, especially in the direction with microservices, which were becoming more popular, which, which was starting to become very popular. Um, just like Jakarta EE, there are multiple implementations. So there are implementations that run, that are a part of your Jakarta EE, Java EE, Jakarta EE containers. So like Gla uh, Pyera, uh, Tom EE, uh, uh, Open Liberty uh, implement not only Jakarta EE, Java EE, but also the Eclipse microprofile. So you get both of them within the same container. Um, there are also some non-Java EE, Jakarta EE implementations of the microprofile as well, which do not have some of the same features of that. They have different characteristics. Some of them, for example, run on GraalVM compiled code and, and, and excellent place to actually write microservices. Uh, the baseline subset of Java EE technology served as a for the first release. So it started out the, the first release of microprofile started out with CDI, JAX RS, et cetera. Uh, the current stable release as of, I think, two months ago is now um, CD, uh, microprofile version three. Um, if you're new to MicroProfile and want to get a quick starter application, um, this is currently in beta. Um, if you scan the code over there on the right, it'll take you to startmicroprofile.io. And you pick which version, you, know, you type in your Maven coordinates and which version of the specification you want and which application server or server you want to target, and it will generate a sample project for you to get going. So it's a great way. Yeah, all the There's demos of each, each one of the features within it. So it's a great way to actually get up and running with MicroProfile if you're new to it. Um, it's kind of like the, the Spring Boot stuff um, for bootstrapping you and getting you going with a starting project. So that's for the MicroProfile to get you up and running. Um, that's handy if you're coming from the Java EE space and you want to understand like what are the features with MicroProfile. This is a great place to, to start and to, and to use it. Um, so common questions, FAQs, uh, what is the relationship between MicroProfile and Jakarta EE? Um, as I mentioned a few moments ago, there are two independent Eclipse projects currently. Um, there's been some discussion about um, <coughs> uh, you know, whether the projects should merge, et cetera, but that's to be determined in the future at some point uh, by both communities. Um, are the microprofile projects standalone? Um, not necessarily. So in the Java EE space in the past, you'd always have like you could take JSONB and use that outside of a container. That's not necessarily true for the microprofilers, microprofile stuff. You can't necessarily take an implementation of, say, health check, you know, add a health check into a Tomcat container, for example. So you can't necessarily do that. Uh, do all Java EE containers uh, support microprofile? The answer is no to that. And I'll have a slide up there with which ones actually support it and which versions support it. Um, do all micro profile implementations support Jakarta EE? The answer is no there. There are some non-Jakarta uh, Java EE containers. That being said, the first release contained a subset of the technologies, JAXRS, CDI. Um, so with those containers, it's more of a case of like if you're using like container managed beans or something like that, that you'd run, in, that you'd run into stuff that wasn't supported. 
Um, will Jacquard E and MicroProfile merge? Um, there's been a lot of questions about this in the past. That's unknown. Um, now they do have two separate release cycles. So the MicroProfile right now is releasing, is doing I think four releases per year. So it's quarterly. So they're pushing out four updates per, per year. Um, Jacardi EE, that's still up in the year, maybe yearly, maybe every six months. I think that's that's unknown at this point. Um, can Jacardi EE applications use MicroProfile APIs? Yes, and that's what the po purpose of this presentation is, is going over the fact that all the stuff all the stuff in MicroProfile you can leverage in your Jacardi EE applications to make them, Java EE applications to make them better, more robust, et cetera. Um, do MicroProfile APIs require a microservices architecture? The answer is no. So although the micro profile, you hear it talked about a lot in terms of microservices, all of the stuff you can still use with your large monolithic Java EE application. So if you have an application that's been being developed for the last 20 years, it's got you know a couple million lines of code, you can use everything in this everything that I'm going to cover in this presentation in your existing app to to you know add additional features and capabilities to it and make it better. Um, so the specifications that make up the 3.0 release of MicroProfile, um, uh, these are the specifications. So we've got open tracing, which deals with if you're passing messages between multiple services, basically tracking you know, that and being able to see what's actually happening. So if you've got one service that calls another service that calls another service, that's where open tracing comes in. Um, open API, which deals with documenting REST services. So this is basically WSDL for REST. So um, <coughs> You want to be able to, it's basically Swagger. Um, so this is, you can, with this as we'll see, you can either provide a Swagger documentation, the Swagger, you can either build up your, your documentation programmatically, you can add annotations, or you can provide a file defining what your service endpoints are. So there's three different approaches with that, depending upon which way you're, which approach you want to take. Um, there's the config API, so this is a standard configuration API. So a lot of existing applications, including the one that I work on, has over time implemented its own configuration system, right, to get configuration in there, right? Um, so this is a standard API that's been added with several different mechanisms of getting configuration into your application in a standardized way using dependency injection. Uh, fault tolerance, this deals with situations where you have services, you know, RESTful JAX-RS services, which are failing, right? You know, do you want to have, if, if it fails, do you want to allow retries? Do you want the container to retry the, the message to it multiple times? Do you want it to back off? You know, things like that. Um, metrics, uh, this allows you to expose metrics to other monitoring tools about your application. So it provides you with a standard way of describing metrics that you are trying to capture in your application so you can expose it other things. So if you have like an APM tool like AppDynamics, Dynatrace, Prometheus, et cetera, it provides you with a standard way of publishing um, information from your application um, to those tools for monitoring purposes. Um, so in the past I've used, I've done more things with like uh, JMX Beans or something like that and then other apps I've worked on have had nothing. Right? You have to actually go use the application to find out. Um, JWT Propagation, there's been several sessions this week on that one. Um, that's basically dealing with security in terms of the tokens um, tying into if you're working with cloud services and you're trying to do kind of like sign on type stuff and pass that information around. Um, health check, uh, this has to do basically providing your application, this is a really simple specification, this is providing your application with a way of communicating am I good or not, right? Um, very often I've seen in applications where the application's been installed, they think it's running, and the question is, what's, is, it, is it actually running? So somebody goes to the application and tries to do something, or goes to the log file and looks for a magical you know, statement in the log file that says, I'm good to go. So this provides a way of exposing that so other tools can respond to it. In the case of uh, cloud stuff like Kubernetes, this, is, this tells the Kubernetes thing whether the application is toast or not, right? So this is a standard way of, of it's basically, it's a up or down, yes or no. Is this application good or not? Uh, CDI 2.0, which is a part of the Jacardi EE, um, JSONP, so these are the standard technologies from the, um, uh, the, the Java EE technologies, which I won't cover, which I assume everyone's already familiar with. Uh, the other one that I forgot to mention was the REST client, which provides basically a, a better wrapper around REST, making REST calls to other services, kind of a more standard API that allows you to use interfaces, et cetera, and that kind of clashes with some of the newer stuff that's going on with um, REST. Um, so these are the APIs which are not a part of um, um, 
uh, Jacardi, so with the exception of the rest clients, is also not a part of it. I should have see the contrast on that. That one should have been red as well. Um, so these are the ones that are specific to micro profile, which you do not have in the baseline Java EE. Now all of your Java EE containers basically now have these, so you can begin using these features right now in your applications without really having to do anything. You don't. You'll, you just have to add an extra entry to your POM file and you're good to go and you can begin using them. It's not even an extra jar file you have to include in your application because it's already there on the application server. Um, so monolithic applications, because most of the talks at the conference so far have been microservices. You know, everything has to be a microservice, right, including the departmental app with five users, right? Um, so many, monolith many Java EE, Jakarta EE applications are monolithic. Um, I at one point had found a statistic that Currently, 90% of the applications out there are still monolithic. I have not been able to refine that link to actually cite it, so that did not make it into the presentation. Um, but monolithic Java E, Jakarta E applications aren't dead yet, and I doubt they will be dead for a long time. In fact, there's, a, um, there's an insurance company back home that was rolling out a updated policy system, and they decided it would be cheaper to just take the existing code base, clone it, and make the changes. It was a COBOL program from 1968. It was decided that it was too complicated to rewrite, right? So they just took and cloned it. So, you know, I'm, I'm sure that there's going to be Java. Some, some of the applications that have been developed with this will still be running years later. I know of other companies that are still running Java for applications from 2003 on Java 1.3. Um, so no doubt um, that will be going on for a long time. Um, and also with, with it, for, for many of the things with, um, that Java E is good for building. Um, not every application needs the scalability of Amazon, Netflix, whatever, right? Not everybody's developing something that needs to scale across thousands of services. But all the nice stuff that's been added with the micro profile, you can take advantage of it in those applications, right? So, um, and also rewriting monolithic applications is not always feasible. Um, with these APIs available in the container, you can begin to, if you know, if you do have scalability problems, you can begin developing microservices and splitting up your application. So you have the capabilities there and you can migrate to it. You don't have to switch to another framework. So if you want to go, if you have an existing application, you want to go microservices, you don't have to rewrite your application for Spring Boot. You have the capabilities in your EE contain in your Jakarta EE containers, and you can port your application without changing the technology stack and do it, you know. Um, with that, so the MicroProfile EE container support eases this capability and it gives you additional features to your existing application. So whether you're going to make the jump to microservices with an existing application or going to transition some parts of it to it that need it or are just going to leave your application in a monolithic application alone, you've got you know, several different, you now have several different options and you don't have to switch technology stacks. Um, so the benefits of MicroProfile, micro um, one is application monitoring. Um, which is a thing of mine that I'd, I'd really like is to know whether the application is actually working and what's actually happening. So as we can see with the health check and the metrics, this gives you kind of a way of easily doing that um, without having to, and some of the code that I've written in the last couple of years, writing JMX beans, which I find to be a real pain in the black art of doing and also hard to, to, to set up and configure. Um, standardized configuration. Um, I think every place that I've ever worked has developed their own configuration system for the application. Seems to be like a um, it <laughs> drives me nuts because it's, it's it's different at every place and there's a, an incredible amount of time that's gone into it and over time it kind of gets really messy and complicated um, so standardized configuration is nice uh, REST documentation being able to provide uh, standard uh, being able to document your REST APIs so that you can give it to somebody else right so that somebody else that needs to use your REST services can easily do that and you don't have to manually update the REST services. Um, fault tolerant and resiliency, being able to mark on a service, okay, something's happened, you know, if this exception is being thrown, then redirect over to here. You know, being able to specify what's going to happen as opposed to just having an exception go blasting back that might only be transitory. Like, um, for example, in applications, I've had people that start, you know, the application is barely deployed yet and somebody's already hammering it with requests before something else has finished initializing. So this gives you a way to say, okay, you know, you only are to mark this as failed after three attempts, and I want you to do a delay of you know 30 seconds because you know the rest of the system hasn't finished initializing yet. So things like that, um, scalability, uh, service tracing, and also the ability to tie in with the security stuff. Um, so the micro profile has um, been evolving. So this was the September of 2016 when it first came out, 
I remember when it first came out because I looked, I looked at it and I said, well, I have all of that stuff in Jakarta E. What's so exciting about this, right? That was so initially I took a look at it at that point and so, said, well, okay, it's a new specification with these three things in it. That's not terribly exciting because I have all of those three things. So I kind of tuned out for a while um, as it continued to evolve. So the first new one that they added was in August of 2017. They added the config API to it. Um, so then it got started getting a little bit more interesting because, okay, you know, that's a problem that I've always had with applications is how do you configure them. Um, I've seen some applications where, you know, you have like a million parameters that get passed in, uh, you know, dash D parameters that get passed into the application server to configure it and all kinds of, you know, LDAP customizations and everything like that. So it becomes a mess over time. So I was excited about this one. And the configuration API is also pluggable. So you can plug in different things into it. So if you have, if you, if you have a system that's storing configuration in a database or LDAP or something like that, there's different ways you can, you can adapt it. And then September 2017, it started exploding. So they started adding more specifications to it. So health check, first version of the health check came out, metrics, uh, fault tolerance, and um, the propagation security stuff. So, and the, uh, these were, yep, so these were added. And then January 2018, it continues to expand out. Now some of the specs aren't changing. Some of the other ones, you know, new ones are being added um, to it. Uh, then, you know, one, uh, June of 2018, once again, we get another update with a whole bunch of new updates to the different specifications, micro profile. And then in um, June of 2018, JSONB gets added to the standard, which is JSON binding. Um, so that's new, and the CDI stuff and JSONP, et cetera, get updated. And then OpenTracing gets updated in Oct October of 2018, 2019. So as you can see, there's a constant, you know, there's, it's a release train. So every four months, there's, every couple of months, there's another release. And if there's no updates to a specification, that just stays the same. If there's updates or new features to the new one, that, 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 uh, those then appear, right? So MicroProfile 3, which came out of June of 2019. And you know they're continuing to work on stuff. There's a lot of work that's going into doing reactive stuff. Um, so that's coming down the pike. Um, there's already builds of that out there. Um, so there's there's quite a bit. So this has been a constant. You know, if we look at, we've been on if you, for practically the entire existence of MicroProfile, we've been on the same version of Java E, which is Java E8. Um, this has had uh, multiple. <laughs> I forgot to count them, but multiple releases since then. So there's been, you know, a, a cadence of releases and features being added. So if you haven't been paying attention to Micro profile and you've only been looking at the Jakarta E stuff, it really hasn't changed much in, in several years. All the innovation has been going on over here with all kinds of new stuff coming out and the stuff is all available in your containers today. <coughs> um, so it's got a large community behind it. So there are implementations and features being developed by all of these organizations. Um, so Pyera, Tom Tribe, uh, Oracle, IBM, uh, Red Hat, um, they're all heavily involved with the micro profile and con contributing to it. Um, as well as some of the open source communities. Um, so there's, there's a lot of community involvement in it, unlike other technology stacks where it's basically a, a single vendor that's, that's pushing it forward. Um, this one has got a community, disparate communities that are, that are working on the different specifications for it. So it's, it's very active and uh, very dynamic and sometimes very hard to keep track of what's going on because there's so many different discussions going on. Um, there's actually Gitter discussion, uh, uh, discussions on Gitter, so there's quite a bit of stuff going on. Um, now, there's multiple implementations of it. So you have Pyera, which if you're not familiar with Pyera, Pyera is a distribution of Glassfish. Yep, so that one has a micro profile, Tom EE, um, which is Tomcat plus EE stuff, plus the micro profile stuff has been very active. Uh, Quarkus, which is not actually a, um, um, a Jakarta EE implementation, so it's a pure micro profile implementation. Um, that one, I believe, if I remember right, that one is running on Grail VM, so that's like where you compile your services to native code. So you get all the capabilities of the, the MicroProfile platform and you compile, you use Grail VM to compile it to, to, um, to native code um, and it gets deployed up on a, a service that was extremely fast for developing microservices. Um, Helidine, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, um, is from Oracle. Um, uh, the one that begins with a K, which I, escapes me on how to pronounce it. Um, that's another pure micro profile implementation. And also WebSphere Liberty, which is, has, has been very extremely active in developing micro profile stuff. So all of these are implementations of micro profile. Um, I also heard, I haven't updated the slide yet, 
Uh, Wildfly, I believe, has early access of uh, MicroProfile 3 coming out. Um, as I heard the other day. Um, so for migrating to MicroProfile, so if you, depending upon what container you're using right now, so if you're deploying right now in a uh, GlassFish container and running GlassFish 3 or 4, if you move over to Pyre, which is GlassFish, it's just a different distribution of it, you get the MicroProfile stuff. If you're on IBM WebSphere, move over to WebSphere Liberty, Tomcat to Tom EE. Uh, really the only one that, that doesn't have a migration story yet that I'm aware of um, or that I've tried is um, WebLogic because WebLogic right now doesn't support the micro profile. So that's kind of the only admin out right now on the, uh, um, the stuff. But, micro, but Oracle does have a implementation of the micro profile. I just don't know what the overlap is between the two of them. Um, so this is a micro profile release matrix. So not all of the containers support all of the versions. Um, so this can be, um, so the blue entries are actually ones that are Jakarta EE. Uh, the Thorntail one that I've, I've listed right there that I believe that's end of life because they are moving to Quarkus instead. So there seems to be more discussion about Quarkus, so I've, I've, from, that's from what I've heard. Um, so these, the blue ones, are your um, Jakarta EE container, uh, sorry, Java EE, con yeah, Jakarta EE containers. And you can see the green check marks are you know, whether it supports that release or not. So sometimes they skip a release, the containers, and, and um, so that's something to be aware of when you're going with the micro profile. You have to check to see which container you're using and what, you know, release of the micro profile. So I did a lot of prototyping for the presentation on Pyera, which doesn't support micro profile three. Um, I had downloaded Open Liberty and was futzing around with that for the micro profile, some of the micro profile three stuff because there's actually some backward uh, compatibility change things that have been broken. So it's fixing that. And the thing to realize with the slide is that. It's up to date as of a couple of days ago. In three months or four months, it's going to be out of date. So if you go back to this presentation in December, trying to make a decision, this stuff is out of this stuff will be out of date because this this stuff, unlike the the Jakarta E ecosystem, which has been moving fairly slowly, this stuff is moving fairly fast, and will probably be out of date in another week or two. Um, so uh, the other consideration to realize is that for if you're still stuck on Java EE seven, then you're going to be looking at micro profile the one. Uh, .x line, if you are on, jar, on Java Jakarta EE8, um, then you're going to need um, uh, the, uh, the 2.0 and, and 3 releases of MicroProfile. And if your requirement is to run on Java 11, the only two containers right now that I'm aware of that have support for Java 11 are Open Liberty and Pyera. And that's, I'm not, and I did try running some things on Java 12 and 13 and wasn't successful. So that's kind of still kind of out there. Um, so I had some fairly interesting exceptions uh, with that. Um, so anyway, so that's just to be in mind. So if you're running, so depending upon your mix, it's a little bit more complicated. So if your organization says you have to be on the most recent version of Java because of licensing changes, then that's gonna dictate which container that you get to use. Okay. Um, any examples, I'll push to a repository later. Um, I was developing and using the cargo tracker example application. Um, so I have to push it, I'll push it later. I have one more defect to um, try fixing that has been frustrating me, um, deployment. Um, and it's the newer version of cargo tracker. There's the official one that's up there on the website, then there's the Java EE 8 one. And I've been fighting with some changes because it got ported over to the uh, Java 8 uh, date time stuff and there's a couple of bugs with that um, that I'm trying to work out in the migration with that. So Maven coordinates, so up on the left is your Java EE8 uh, Maven coordinates. Um, so those are stay the same. The newer one that you'll add to get the micro profile stuff is down there on the right. And so I've added 2.2 um, for that. You can put three depending upon which container you're using. And that is all you need to do. Note that this is provided uh, which means that you do not need to, you're not gonna include, it's not gonna increase the size of your application. You don't have to worry about that. These are the dependent, all the APIs are provided as a part of the uh, micro profile specification. So these will be in your application container. You don't have to do anything extra. You're just adding this entry to your POM file so that your IDE can find the code and you get code completion and compilation, right? Because it's not part of the dependencies for Jakarta EE8. So this is, this is all you have to do, and then you can begin using the feature. So it's really nice. Okay, now, so now I'm going to look at some of the individual, the newer features that were added as a part of um, 
uh, the microprofile specification. So the first one is OpenAPI, uh, which is a unified Java API for the OpenAPI version 3 specification. Um, it generates uh, OpenAPI Swagger documents from JAX-RS endpoints. So basically, this is WSDL for REST. Um, so you've got several different, it's enabled by default in the micro, micro profile applications and it is configurable via the micro profile config API. So you can also programmatically work with this. So you can either build up the document programmatically, you can annotate it, or you can provide a document which the container is gonna serve up for you. So this feature is enabled by default on your application. Um, so it, you can augmenting existing JAX-RS2. So basically you take your existing JAX-RS2 annotations and you just add additional annotations to them to provide readable text as for what, what's actually going on here. And then in order to access the documentation, it's generated on the fly or it serves up your document under slash open API. So you'd go to your container, if it's running on port 8080, you go colon 8080 slash open API and you'll get your Swagger document basically served up to you, your documentation for your endpoints, nicely served up. Now, if you haven't documented anything, the container's gonna take a crack at it and generate a document for you. So really, you only need to add the annotations to provide metadata and human readable text explaining different things, nuances that would not, that the container can't automatic, cannot insert. Um, and so you can, you, you can use the programming model to bootstrap the completed API tree. So I'm not gonna go over each one of the, the annotations and I just threw this in here so that you could kind of see all the different annotations that you can add to your JAX RS services. So it's a fairly robust and large set of annotations for it. So you know the main one that you end up using is like the um, operation, operation like parameter, et cetera. So operation, you document what this operation does and document what an individual parameter is. Um, so you just add these annotations onto your JAX RS service. So it goes in with the rest of your your JAX RS annotations, so you just add these additional annotations to them. So as you can see, we've got all off flows, header and you know, documenting for header stuff. Um, there's a ton of annotations here. So this is really easy to, 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 to work with. Um, and a couple more annotations here. Okay. Um, now, if you are providing, if, if your organization, instead of, instead of um, having it auto-generated prefers to have a document where you've created the document and then have that document served up. So say you're more of a, a document first and then, then you write the code type, type place. Um, you can provide, the, you can dump the document into web app uh, meta inf and it goes under this name open API YAML file and then that will get served up instead. All right. Um, so you can either, you got different approaches so you can either add annotations to the code or provide a document or the third way which I'm not going to cover is to programmatically build it up. So if you have if you have some custom objects or something like that where you're doing um, some really custom framework, uh, custom message generation, you can do that programmatically. Um, so this is an example here where I've annotated a, a method, you know, get shipments. Oh, I should have left that. <laughs> Out, hello world. Um, so anyways, this is annotating the operation and the API response, you know, it's gonna return a 200 and the successful shipment was okay. Um, you actually kind of see that over here where it has, you know, the, the, it'll generate the same document. So this is the same document that'll get generated regardless, but you're just adding annotations to your JAX RS web services. So this, this makes it really easy to document your existing RESTful web services so that, you know, external vendors and companies can easily consume them. Okay. Uh, the next one is the config API. Um, so this is a standard configuration API that was built into the micro profile, separate specification. Um, configuration sources that drive it, so you can have a micro profile dash config.properties file in your meta inf directory. It can pull the parameters from system properties, environment variables, or custom. So you can provide a, a jar file that you know, knows how to read it out of a database. You can provide, you know, pull the configuration out of, you know, if you have a custom configuration system already in your application. So what's nice about the, the custom one is that you can pull it out of LDAP, you can pull it out of a database, or if you've got an existing configuration system in your application and you just wanna get those parameters so that you can inject them into code with CDI so you don't have you know, statics everywhere. Um, some of the applications I've worked on use this static singleton class which has all the configuration. Now you can write a wrapper around that 
and then you'll get your dependency, so you can write a, a plugin for it, basically, and then you'll be able to inject those configuration parameters into your, you know, JAX RS endpoints and beams and everything, and then you won't have everybody depending upon this, you know, static singleton class. So it allows you, so you have multiple ways there, but you won't, and the nice thing is you won't then have to update your old code, right? You can get to it as you want, so it's not a, you know, kind of that. So this is one of my uh, favorite features uh, with it. Um, so the config API, this is basically how you use it. It's fairly straightforward. You have your property, in this case right here, it's client name, so for this application for whoever, you know, the company that's installed it, so they purchase the application, install it, or they request it up in the cloud. It gets written into a configuration environment variable, and then I can easily inject it. All right. So, you know, really nice. I don't have to go off and figure out how to pull that value in or something like that. Um, so this works really nicely, and then being able to pull it from system variable, uh, uh, sorry, system environment variables, and the rest of it works nice with containers. So if you're deploying with Docker, you can easily parameterize the configuration for your application. You don't have to have a custom configuration file that somebody has to, to write and provide into the application. Uh, so that was the config API. As you can see, it's, I mean, I didn't cover the, the programmatic API for it, but it's, it's really simple. You can start using it today. It doesn't require a you know 300-page book to figure out. Right? Uh, that's basically all you need, and it will do con type conversions. Uh, fault tolerance. The idea behind fault tolerance is to separate execution from the execution logic. Um, it dictates when the ex execution should take place, and fallbacks are alter alternative result when execution does not com is not completely successful. Um, it's influenced by hysterix and failsafe. Um, so there's three different, uh, sorry, four different uh, fallback policies. We've got a retry policy, a fallback, a bulkhead, and a circuit breaker. So uh, retry policy define, you know, you define the criteria for when you want to retry. A fallback allows you to provide an alternate solution for a failed execution. So something happens, where do you want it to fall back to? Who do you want it to call? A bulkhead isolates failures in, part, in parts of the system. And a circuit breaker app uh, offers a way to fail fast. So if the call failed, you know, previously failed, right, and you have a circuit breaker set, it's going to fail again. You have, uh, with the circuit breaker, has the ability to, like, test it, and if something, if it service whatever appears to be returning back to normal, then it will, you know, allow it to, it'll re-enable that service, so to speak. So, yes. Yeah, so, so, it would be, so, so this would be dealing with like an exception. So you invoke the application and you've run out of connections to the database, right? Your, your data source is configured you know, correct, incorrectly, somebody's leak. Yeah, and so that, that would be a fault. So what that's gonna do, what that's gonna do, what this is gonna do is this is gonna say, okay, you know, just fit, you know, with a circuit breaker, you just would say, okay, that's happened before. You know, the service, the last three times somebody has called it has failed, so now I'm going to, I'm just gonna return instantly. I'm not gonna bother the database at this point. Yeah, yeah, so you can specify the exceptions. Yep, mm-hmm, yep, yep, mm-hmm, yep. Yes, yeah, correct, yeah, so that's. Yep, yeah, so it gives you the, the capability for doing that, because I mean, I've run into situations with applications where you know, somebody starts calling the thing before it's finished initializing, right? Somebody, sit, somebody has another process that's just sitting there. As soon as the thing binds to the port, it begins hammering it, right? And, you know, somebody didn't quite take into account that there was another race condition in the system that has to load some other pick list from something else. So that's where that, this, this comes in handy. And also for, you know, failures where something is just transitory, where something just disappeared momentarily. And, and I realize that this stuff was developed for stuff up in the cloud where servers are going away and failing constantly, right? So the, up in the cloud, you're running stuff on the cheapest hardware that's possible, and VMs and servers frequently crash, and they'll just be unavailable momentarily for a second. You may not have realized that you've been running something up in the cloud, and it's failed and it's rolled over. So failures up there are moment, you know, are momentarily, you know, something will fail over to another server, temp, you know, temporarily, or it will be back in a second. So there's all kinds of things that can go wrong with that. Right. So you're talking to another service, and you know, temporarily that service is unavailable. Um, so this is an example of fault tolerance retry. Um, so as you can see right here, you can specify. Now I've, I've tried to fill out as many of the, the op options as possible. So I have a delay of <coughs> on the retry that will delay 400. I think it's um, uh, 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 um, 
400, not 400 seconds, but 400 microseconds or something like that for maximum du uh, max duration of 3200. Um, there's a jitter um, which says that instead of having predictable, you know, it'll like it'll be off by like 400, so you don't always get like the same pattern with the back off, right? So it gives you a, a jitter capability with that. So in this case right here, it's a max uh, number of retries, and it'll retry if it's an I/O exception that was thrown. Otherwise, it just fails immediately. And so this is, you know, in order to get this capability, wrapping your service, all you have to do is add this annotation to your code. So if you have an existing monolithic application with Jax RS Web Services, you just add this annotation to it, and now you've got retry. Now you don't have to have put this type of logic into your client application in order to try to do that. So this moves over, you know, this makes things a little bit easier. Um, this is a fallback. So there's two different ways of doing a fallback. One is to have a fallback method, and the other one is to have a fallback class with a handler. So in this case right here, um, this is a fallback method, so this is going to fall back to a shipment status. So this is going to fall to another method in the class that's private. And so, if this the guy blows up, then it calls the other method and says, and you can return something else. So you could have a cached, you know, perhaps your, you know, the system that it's trying to talk to is down, and you grab a cached copy of the data or something like that. It gives you the opportunity to do things like that. Um, this is the fallback with a uh, fallback class. In this case, right here, you're calling into a another service. Um, which is uh, templated with it. As you can see here, within the execution context, you get an execution context is passed in. So you can get a hold of the failure, you can get a hold of the method that was called, the parameters that were passed in. So you can try to do something, right? You have some capability there to say, okay, this is, you know, I, you know, you can try to handle it. Um, bulkhead prevents failure of a service from triggering a, from triggering a cascade effect to other services. Um, so basically, semaphore. So this is basically um, controlling the number of concurrent executions. So if, if you're writing stateless session beans, right, you have a pool of them, so you can only have ten of them in memory at a given time or whatever. So this basically is limiting the number of instances that you have. Um, there's two different: there's semaphore and uh, thread pool style. Um, so the example down below. So we can have a waiting. So this is um, waiting task down below of twenty holds on to. Uh, circuit breaker prevents uh, repeated failures so that dysfunctional services and AP or APIs fail fast. So the circuit breaker, the states are normally closed, so which means that it's operating normally. And it does track failure. So if a failure happens, it says, okay, you know, something has happened, right? Continues along, you know, keeps keeps tracking that. Um, and it will it can, you know, if it eventually closes, it can transition um, to open contingent on a request volume threshold or a failure ratio, right? Um, which I'll get into in a second. Open call fails immediately. If a delay is configured, it will transition to half open, right? So you can have basically, you know, it, it failed, uh, you know, it's, it's failed 10 times in a row, so obviously something is toast. So you don't want to even invoke the logic that's in here. And then, you know, it can allow a couple of trials through, and if the service appears to be returning to normal, then it will transition back to uh, closed, right? So you can be it can be closed, which is normal, everything's working fine, open, the system is broken, or half open, which basically means you're allowing some things to try it, to try to make it through to see if the system is returning to normal, right? You know, perhaps you have too much load coming into the system so that, you know, there's a defect with the, how the data is being pulled out of the database where you end up with a deadlock or something like that if too many people are accessing the system at a given time. So this gives you kind of control over things like that. Um, so this is an example, uh, fault tolerance example right here with the um, now, all of these annotations that I've just covered, you can actually use these together. So they're not, you know, I get retry or I get fallback. These, you can actually hook them all together to build up a really complex um, a failure thing. For So in this case right here, we have a circuit breaker with a fail on runtime exception class. Uh, threshold is one, so if one of them fails, um, you have a delay of 10, uh, 10 seconds. Um, we have a timeout. Um, that was the other thing that I haven't covered yet is a timeout. So we can say basically fail if the service takes too long to respond, right? So that's another, yes? Can we use the function for any level Yeah, this is, this is for, uh, for, uh, for Jack's RS endpoints for web service. Okay. Yeah, yeah, for service methods, yep. Yep. So, um, so anyway, so you can see right here I'm using circuit breaker, I'm using timeout, I'm using bulkhead, I could use retry, I could, add, you know. So this gives you quite a bit of capability to it. It'd be nice if we had a CDI stereoscope, uh, sorry, one where we could just condense all of them into one annotation, but maybe a future release, we'll get that. 
Um, but there's quite a bit of power in this, and you can use these in your existing Jakarta EE, your existing Java EE applications. You don't have to, you know, you already have it there in your container. A health check. Um, health checks probes the state of a compute node from another machine. Um, so this is an example of this would be used from like something like Kubernetes service controller, also your APM tools. Um, so um, like, you know, if you're running AppDynamics or, you know, something Dynatrace or something like that, you can have health checks that tie into those types of systems. Um, this is, I think, kind of a good idea to implement in your system whether you're using Kubernetes or not because frequently the question with software is, you know, somebody has installed the software and is it actually running, right? What's, what's actually happening? Or if it's not running, why is it not running, right? So it gives you, it's an either an up or a down, yes or no, the software is either foobar or it's running, right? There's the two choices there. Um, and so the health check response, you can uh, name, you provide a name to identify the probe, an up or down flag to indicate the state, and then metadata for key value pairs. Um, so the API is very simple, it's a functional, uh, sorry, health check with a single call on it, and you get a response that you get to send back with your state being up or down, the name, the state, and your hash map of properties. So this is an example right here where I'm basically checking, you know, I'm saying the system, that whether the system is running okay or not is contingent upon whether the data system can access the database, right? So in this health check right here, I, you know, get my data source and I basically check to see is it valid, um, and then depending whether it's valid or not, I write back some information like what database am I connecting to, you know, what's the username, is it valid, et cetera. I build up and send a response back, and it returns back JSON. If you if you send a, it's basically it's like a JAX RS endpoint health service, so it returns back JSON. So you, this is the message that comes back, right? So if it's Kubernetes or some other system, they know how to process this, right? This is really easy to deal with. Uh, you can access it in the web browser by just doing slash health at the end, and you get this output. So all of your applications that are deployed to the container, right here I only have one application deployed with this cargo tracker, but you get for all of your applications that that have implemented health check, you get a report back as for what, what their status is. So I think this is a great, great thing to add. Uh, metrics, uh, so health checks are just simply a yes or no. Uh, metrics uh, provide beyond health check information. Um, so they provide information that allows you to record, you know, how often this method has been invoked, you know, uh, stuff like that, um, and they're exposed via REST. Now there is base metrics that um, the container uh, base, which the container must provide, which is just basic information about its operating environment. Um, application, which provides metrics from the applications, and then metrics from the vendor that are vendor specific. So the first one is actually in the specification. It's gonna provide like, you know, what the load on the system is, how much memory, blah, 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 blah. Uh, so these are the annotations for metrics for annotating your code, and I put down a little key at the bottom for constructor field method or parameter type. So we got counted, which counts invocations. So you want to record how often is your JAXRS web service invoked? You add at, at counted to it. Now you're tracking, you know, how often it is counted. You want to get, you know, the concurrent gauge. You know, how many parallel invocations of your service are being executed, right? Um, metered, you want to track the frequency of the invocations, right? Uh, metrics, so it uses CDI produces, so it allows you more uh, information and also time. Tracks the duration, so how long is the service taking to, 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 uh, to invoke? So all of these capabilities you have, so you can, you know, on your existing JAXRS services, you start adding these annotations, and now you can begin recording statistics that you then are, can, you know, and this, this feeds in a standardized format, feeds like Prometheus and your monitoring tools, right? So you can save this into like a time series database and then go back in time and say, okay, you know, at, at Friday there were, you know, 50, on Friday there were 100 concurrent invocations of the service. And so this is an example right here, so this is for if you just go to, and, and the, UR, the uh, URLs are standard, so here I did metrics, right? So as you can see right here, I just did slash metrics, and this is the information that's standard that gets returned. Um, now for my own specific stuff, I've added in a, a counted, and you can see right here, I've added in counted with some information, you know, configuration of the counted, so it's just not counted. You can provide, you know, the name, the description, and everything else. And you can see if I just go into the web browser as opposed to using curl and saying I'm taking JSON back, it provides a a textual description coming back to me telling me what's going on. Open tracing allows the flow of, uh, tra tracing the flow of requests in a distributed environment. Um, so this is basically, because um, we're kind of running out of time, um, this allows you to trace methods, uh, trace requests going through the system. So if your one web service calls another web service calls another web service, and one of those fails, 
This provides you a way of finding out, you know, what's actually going on with your messages as they go through the system. You can, it's on by default, or you can annotate it. Um, you can also uh, kick it off. You can inject the tracer and then start, you know, setting tags and spans, et cetera, with it. Um, JWT, if I'm pronouncing that right, this is um, uh, stateless. This is, has to do with security and uh, tokens and OAuth. So if you're working with cloud providers with uh, stuff like that, uh, definitely check that out. And this is an example. There were several sessions in the conference so far on this. Um, JAX RS client provides basically a better API for dealing with JAX. Um, uh, JAX RS uh, services, so it allows you to do this where I have, you know, my booking service that I call, right, instead of having to programmatically build it up, um, provides you with a nice, nicer interface for being able to communicate with it. And so some of the challenges with working with MicroProfile and, and um, Jakarta E, one is the rapid evolution in API changes, so in the Java E space, things usually move slower. So in the MicroProfile space, we have updates that are coming on a regular basis. In the case more recently, the health check, I believe, had some back, uh, broke some API. So if you were working on the previous version, the newer version has some API changes. So you have to be aware of that. Um, there's an implementation lag on the specification. So like three is out, but not all the containers support three. There's a confusing matrix of support. So you look at your, con you know, the container that you're using and figure out, and the version of Java that you're using now, and try to figure out, okay, which way am I going? Um, and then currently, so right now there's uh, no uh, web logic support for MicroProfile at last check. And I believe Wildfire is currently in early access. Um, it came up in the session yesterday. So in summary, microprofile capabilities are now present in most Java EE, Jakarta EE containers. So all the stuff I've covered here, you can begin using today. Um, so you can leverage microprofile to document your RESTful web services, standardize configuration, improve health and monitoring, trace requests, and tie into platform security better. Uh, some resources, and then my contact information, and we're over. So I can take questions af afterwards, so thank you. <laughs>